Well, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody today. Uh, really excited about this topic. It might be a new topic uh, for many of you. Uh, today we have uh, our Canadian colleagues, but in addition to that, we have our colleagues uh, from the South, our, our dear neighbors. And so really a warm welcome to our um, American uh, Wound Ostomy Continents um, participants as well. You know, um, I had the opportunity to do my training down in Atlanta, Georgia with Dorothy Dowdy at Emory Medical University. And so I have fond memories of my, my time and my experiences there as well. But let's move along. Um, today, we're gonna talk about continuous diffusion of oxygen. I'm gonna start us off and then Dr. Campbell will join in and then later Kath, Dr. Kathy Much will also be joining us. Both Kathy and I have no relevant financial interest to disclose, and Dr. Campbell is a consultant for EO2. So we're going to jump off this session actually right away with a case study, and uh, it's a very recent case study, uh, really impacted a patient of mine, and it was related to a surgery of breast reconstruction where there had been a reperfusion injury and we needed to see what we could do to enhance the blood flow to this area. It's a 66 year old lady. She had had surgery on October 21st, right breast nipple sparing mastectomy and a right immediate breast reconstruction with the tissue expander and the alloderm was there as well. But it was on a previously uh, irradiated side. So 20 years previously, on that same breast, she had had radiation and of course at the time had had chemo. Um, and so we realized at the time, the surgeon was well aware that this was a high risk procedure because tissues that had been radiated are more at risk. Following surgery, there was an area of tissue necrosis. And you'll see that on November 16th, um, this was particularly discouraging because we thought, with the tissue expander being close um, in the alloderm, what were we going to do? There were thoughts of the patient um, was even entertaining going to hyperbaric despite being in the midst of COVID. And instead, I said, look, rather than that, why don't you stay close to the team, your surgical team, your wound team, and we're going to try continuous diffusion of oxygen. So how we proceeded with that, and she was more than willing, um, we introduced a little unit and a dressing. And in this instance, as we proceed with the next slides, we, we started um, at three milliliters per hour of continuous diffusion of oxygen. And the oxygen goes through a small tubing to a foam dressing. And in this instance, I did use a methylene blue gentian violet dressing and a non-bordered oxygen diffusion foam dressing on top. And you'll, later I include some photos of that so you get a picture. The next slide, um, you'll see the methylene blue and how we laid that on the wound bed, secured the dressing, and I tend to making sure the dressing doesn't slip, use a bit of strip paste around it. The patient wore an easily chargeable unit, as you can see that handheld unit, it's actually quite light. And she would carry that um, or attach it, there's a carrying case attach it to herself. You can already begin to see by December 4th, there's some more, um, a bit of granulation tish, tissue, pinker tissues. Next slide. By 14th, we're definitely seeing substantial improvement and we're pushing away the notion that she would be going to hyperbaric as we felt that this oxygen unit alone was actually transforming the wound bed to a more uh, granulation tissue. You could just see that it was better perfused and the area was becoming smaller. Next slide. I think December 23rd, which I guess, as you can appreciate, it was just before Christmas. And she really felt that this particular unit was a Christmas present to her because you see there was the, the real threat that she would have to have surgery. 
And we wanted to do everything possible to not go back and do surgery on a very high risk situation. And so there was a great deal of joy as we approached Christmas that we were now knowing we were well on our way to an area that was healing well. Next slide. And so as we progress, uh, again, just still using the same products, continuing on, next slide. We got to the point that the plastic surgeon said, Rosemary, this is so good. I'm just gonna approximate the edges. We're gonna leave those sutures in place and we're gonna watch it carefully uh, and continue um, with uh, these continuous diffusion of oxygen. And the next slide, you'll see by the 25th, it, it was closed and she has not reopened. Um, and we are now um, you know, in April. So I, um, it's a very, uh, for me, this, there's another piece about this story that I think is important. This patient struggled with depression. So you can imagine how disheartening it was when she woke up from her revision surgery to see this wound and she just didn't know where she would, what would happen next. So it was wonderful to see her, the anxiety lesson um, and, and have a very successful outcome. And so I'm gonna move the next portion of our presentation though to uh, Dr. Karen Campbell, because I want her to explain a little bit about the science um, behind this, this therapy. Now, Karen is gonna introduce herself. I, I think I forgot to introduce myself. My background is, as I mentioned, a wound ostomy continent nurse trained in, in, at Emory, but I work at Lionsgate Hospital, Vancouver Coastal Health, and I've been um, CWOCN or an NSWOC for about 16, 17 years, but a nurse for about 40 years. Karen, I'm gonna pass things along to you. Um, take it away, Dr. Campbell. Thank you, Rosemary, and thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Karen Campbell. I'm a nurse in Canada. I am as well a certified wound ostomy continence nurse here in Canada. I've been involved in wound healing uh, since 1992, and like Rosemary, I've been a nurse for many, many years. My area of specialty is really, although I'm a WOCC nurse, my focus is more on wound care and uh, continence. And so the objectives for this evening's session are to review the evolution of oxygen and wound healing, discuss features of CDO therapy. I'm going to provide some literature and case studies to support to show you how CDO works, um, how CDO improves uh, pain, wound pain management, and what the cellular response is to CDO. And we've got some exciting research to share. And then uh, Rosemary's presented a case, but Kathy and myself have other cases to present. And we ha I have a case I'm gonna to show to you where a patient was able to self-manage uh, their, their wound care and use virtual wound assessments to see their clinicians. So what is the evolution of, of oxygen therapy? And we compare it to uh, a telephone because as you can see, um, the size of a cell phone, oh, is similar to the size of uh, the CDO unit. Got to go back one more time. And so as you can see when hyperbaric started in the 50s, um, you needed to have a large chamber. Uh, patients had to travel just as we had, you know, tethered uh, telephones. And with technology improvements, now we're down to a very small portable CDO units, similar in size to a, a cell phone. And this actually shows what the unit looks like and what the dressings that accompany the unit looks like. And so you can also see there's a carrying case so that patients could either uh, wear this unit around their waist or on their legs, whatever position is appropriate given the location of their wound. And uh, now I'm gonna start talking about some of the high level evidence that we have regarding CDO. The first study I wanna talk about is a study with diabetic foot ulcers it was a placebo-controlled, randomized, double-blinded, multi-centered study. And you can see in the active arm, patients got a CDO. Everyone was offloaded with an offloading boot. Everyone uh, had moist wound healing dressings in place, as well as the oxygen dressings. 
And if you were in the active arm, the system was preset at three mils per hour. And so the oxygen was flowing 24 seven. And if you were in the placebo arm, you actually had a unit, but there was no oxygen flowing to the wound, even though the system was preset to three mils per hour. Uh, but all of the other treatment was the same other than the active arm received CDO and the placebo arm received nothing. The primary outcome was full wound closure defined as complete re with no drainage. But secondary outcomes were time to wound closure, effective baseline uh, wound size on wound closure and effective chronicity with uh, wound um, area reduction on wound closure. And there were 146 patients in 34 centers across the continental US. There were no significant differences in the arms. So you can see the wound sizes, the average age was in the 50s, the racial makeup uh, and the gender, um, more were male than female. But of interest, all but one patient performed their own dressing changes outside of clinic visits. So that's an important factor when you're thinking about self-management. And so the time to closure was significantly shorter with CDO for all treated subjects. And you can see there that the p-value was 0 0.015. And the time to 50% wound closure was significant shorter with CDO therapy. And that was 18 uh, days in the CDO therapy versus almost 30, 29 days in the uh, sham uh, arm. And that was statistically significant as well. What was really interesting as the wound size increased, relative performance of CDO improved as well. And so there was more benefit for larger wounds. And you can see here, uh, the relative performance um, does increase almost up to 300%, but not quite. The other interesting finding is that as wounds increased in chronicity, and they were less responsive to moist wound therapy, the CDO relative performance increased from 200% to 300%. And the, the p-value went from 0 0.016 to 0 0.008. And so what we take away from that is the more your wound is chronic, the more one needs CDO, the better it, it performs. And again, look at the response here uh, going uh, from 200% up to 340% uh, almost. So in summary, this was a rigorously fully blinded study designed with a placebo, placebo arm and everyone was blinded. Um, patients, participants, physicians did not know uh, who was getting the active treatment. There was a run-in period to screen for wound chronicity. And I believe that is very important in this study because in the run-in period with debridement, with moist wound healing, with offloading, if the participants' wounds were healing really, really quickly, they were not included in the study. Only wounds that were not healing at the rate that you would expect were included in the study. We had highly accurate digital photos and we had planimetry to determine wound size. The, the US CMS cited this study design as the gold standard for studies going forward. And in summary, CDO closed significantly better and faster, over 200%. CDO performed better in larger wounds, more chronic wounds, in weight-bearing wounds, in populations predisposed to diabetes, and in frequently debrided uh, wounds. And in the Hispanic population, uh, the healing rate increased to 382% and almost 82% of those wounds closed. And the other thing that we found in the CDO arm is that there were 75% uh, severe, uh, less severe infection. So that's a very important uh, result for patients with uh, diabetes. So now I'm actually going to tell you uh, a story. Uh, one of our other colleagues that works with us, Edia Trell, this is one of her patients. And you're going to listen to a little story to begin with. Changing the dressings was no problem. It was actually quite simple. Uh, once you had the confidence, it took um, just a matter of uh, short minutes to unscrew tubes, put, take off dressing, put new dressing on. 
and then we hook it up. The, uh, <clears throat> during the time period, uh, the wound got smaller and smaller, which was nice. And But during that time, I did have uh, electronic access via text or pictures to the clinician and was able to just discuss it as it was proceeding. So although I was doing all of this at home, it was as if someone was, was with me. Uh, <clears throat> the wound, as I said, got smaller and smaller, and uh, hopefully in the next week or so, it will have gone away. Uh, I had uh, good results, and uh, I'm very happy with the use of it, and when I look back on it, it really was a very uh, simple process. So uh, I am quite happy with the results. Great, and um, Bill's wound went on to close, and so let me tell you a little bit about his background. 73-year-old man, he was pre-diabetic, he had marginal venous insufficiency, and in March of last year, he had a small red area on his lower leg. His treatment initially was to leave it open to the air, as often you hear from your patients, and to use a Band-Aid, but he then developed contact dermatitis, and then he switched to gauze. Initially, he was managing this wound on his own and later home care nursing became involved. So you can see on April 30th, the ulcer was quite painful. You can see the size there. There was slough present, poor granulation tissue, peri-wound erythema, but it was not warm to touch. And the initial treatment plan with his home care nurse was cadexamer iodine in a foam dressing for two weeks. Um, there was a request from the clinician to have a lower leg assessment and uh, he had uh, 20 to 30 millimeter uh, compression stockings, but he wasn't wearing them. So uh, he was asked to restart wearing them and he was moisturizing his uh, leg because it was dry and itchy. And so he did have a knowledge deficit. So the wound clinician then uh, taught him how to look for changes in wound bed colors. So is the wound sloughy versus is it granulation? He was also taught to look for changes in exudate levels and was the dressing change frequency uh, changed due to the amount of exudate. He was taught about uh, hand washing, wound assessment, dressing changes, and storing and, uh, and carrying of supplies. Uh, he was sending pictures. You can see the pictures that he would send to, the, to the, his wound clinician. And um, you can see that May 15th, after doing all of these interventions, there was little change and CDO was started. Uh, and CDO therapy a month later was continued, but an antimicrobial primary dressing was added to help with his wound healing. Uh, and he would actually draw pictures and send notes to his clinician to describe what was going on in the wound. And we show you this as an example for how your patients could participate even if you had to see them and assess them virtually. And in conclusion, after two months of uh, topical wound therapy that he was doing at home, the wound was larger, two months of care by home care nurses with moist wound healing, the wound was stalled with little change, but after three months of CDO therapy, the wound closed. But remember, this, was, this therapy was done in combination with his compression. He was independent uh, in his dressing changes the EO2 consultant did assessments by photos, phone calls, and periodic home visits. And he was provided with education and ongoing support. And we realized that this was a fairly cost efficient outcome. And in the face of COVID, with the reduction of face to face visits, how relevant this was for his care. So now I'm actually going to switch over and talk a little bit about our study that looks the effect of CDO on pain and treatment of chronic wounds. And you can see the reference there. And this was a pilot study with 20 patients in 23 wounds, most were female, and it was done in Chicago. You can see the average age is older than the diabetic foot ulcer, and the wound size was bigger. And you can see that um, one of the wounds was 117 centimeters squared, but the wound size 
we're anywhere, uh, we're 15 with a standard deviation of almost uh, 28 centimeters squared. You can see that these wounds were chronic. Um, the average age was 162 days. And the standard deviation was plus or minus 115 days. You can see the race makeup, and you can also see that the median baseline pain score was eight on a, a scale of zero to 10. Uh, this slide shows you what the wound types were in the pain level. So the traumatic wounds, although there was only one, the pain score was nine. The most common uh, wound type was mixed venous and vascular. And you can see that was quite painful. So the primary uh, wound type was a mixed venous and vascular, and they were all lower extremities. 87% were above the malleolus. All patients reported significant wound pain relief. 100% um, went to either a zero or one with an open wound. Pain relief was fairly rapid by day four. 39% were uh, pain-free. 52% had a greater than or equal to 75% reduction in pain. And 91% experienced noticeable pain relief and several reported complete pain relief the day of CDO application. And what happened um, in terms of wound closure? So 83% experienced significant or complete closure. That one wound that was 117 centimeters square actually uh, closed uh, and the pain score in the wound went from a 10 down to a zero at the first follow-up. And in wounds that generally did not close, pain relief was dramatic. And so 75% were pain-free by the first follow-up visit. Uh, and CDO enabled stopping the use of narcotic painkillers uh, with many of these patients. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague from PEI, Kathy Munch. Hello, my name is Kathy Munch. I'm an NSPOC of 35 years. Um, I've been very fortunate to have been able to participate in our Canadian Association on a number of activities, for example, in the development of our uh, Canadian NSWAC academic program, in, uh, in the development of the certification program. I've been an academic advisor, education chair for three national conferences, and Atlantic Regional Director. I welcome and I'm glad you're here to join with us today. The case study I'm going to share with you is about a young woman in her 30s who had a chronic painful non-healing leg ulcer. She had a very significant past medical history and quite complicated with drug use, hepatitis C, on methadone program. She had a native valve and art erect endocarditis, um, chronic anemia, PTSD, depression, ADHD, borderline personality disorder, and really struggled to adhere to a therapy plan. I've known her on and off for at least four years uh, with this leg ulcer. We had uh, tried not numerous things and she had been in hospital requiring intensive care for sepsis on numerous occasions. Um, when she arrived to emerge, they called me down to visit her and I found um, her to be extremely frightened, agitated, and in extreme pain. She could barely allow air to pass through the room without becoming increasingly agitated. I spoke briefly and did get a chance to have a look at the wound and then went to speak with her medical team to create a plan. Her plan included admission. I really felt that if we were going to get anywhere, we had to have her in a situation where we could control what was happening and provide her with the best care. That was agreed upon and her um, addiction team was also heavily involved. They had made some adjustments to her medications, which had created some of this pain crisis. Um, and she, she certainly wasn't able to manage without a good intervention for, for pain and addiction issues. Um, so when I did go back to see her the next day, her wound was uh, 9.5 by 6.2 centimeters. Ashgar covered about 85% of the center of the wound, 15% of the wound bed around it was red, but really poorly granulating, very unhealthy. And again, she remained hypersensitive to stimulation. Her pain was, if I asked her 10, she, it was way above 10, she indicated. 
So I'm going to go through some of the treatment plan and how this wound progressed with the use of continuous diffusion of oxygen. So this is March 18th, a couple of, a day after admission. Um, sorry, the quality is not great, but you can see that it was certainly not uh, doing well. Granulation tissue, there was a little red, but very poor and Eshgar covered. Uh, normally, the recommendation would be to remove um, necrotic tissue before starting continuous diffusion of oxygen, but she would not have tolerated uh, going near her to remove any of that necrotic tissue. Um, but fortunately, a couple of days later, even over the necrotic tissue, you can definitely see changes happening. The granulation tissue is becoming healthier, stronger, more viable, and the necrotic tissue is hydrating well and beginning to soften and lift at the edges. By March 25th, I was able to actually, not uh, surprisingly, I was able to debride it. Um, she had her pain management had improved so well with the treatment of her team, as well as with the continuous diffusion of oxygen that really made a significant difference in the, in the pain in, in this wound. Um, and she did allow me to remove the ashgar. Um, a few days later, you'll notice that the granulation tissue is looking um, more red and, and moist in appearance. And that moist appearance is very typical when you're treating someone with CDO. Um, it does seem to hydrate well and, and uh, really uh, creates a great bed for wound healing. This progressed on. You can see how the, um, as the slough is starting to soften a little bit more. And the peri wound, you can see the edges are starting to epithelialize. And um, the wound actually is starting to contract on the sides. It never went down a lot on the top to bottom, but side to side, it, it was contracting inward. But overall, I was very pleased with the health of it. The other thing that was really amazing about this young woman is she, uh, when she first came in, she was placed in a ward and she kept her curtains closed. She wanted to sleep all the time and she wanted people, no one near her bed uh, other than a few of us. And as time went progressed over the few days that she was there, she actually came out from behind the curtains and started to interact with the other elderly women in a room, offering them water, talking to them, and was very engaged with people again. You can see um, by April 18, things are really doing quite well. And the plastic surgeon con was consulted and agreed to do uh, um, some grafting. I saw her again, she was discharged, and I saw her again May 19th. And you can see that the graft took very well. As a side story, while she was on the unit, uh, her family, whose relationship was somewhat strained, were in to visit her. She, she came and went in their lives as well. The grandmother came up to me and she said, you have given me back my granddaughter. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Now it's Karen back and I'm going to be talking about some really exciting uh, clinical evidence that's developing uh, and a, a few studies I'm going to review with you. So the first study that I want to talk about is a study that looked at cytokines, growth factors and perfusion. And um, you can see the reference here if you would like uh, to get the full uh, paper. It's published in the International Wound Journal. So after one week of CDO, there were significant increases in cytokines. Um, and these were changes relative to baseline. So the, so the researchers looked at wound fluid before CDO was started and then looked at wound fluid levels uh, one week, two week, and three weeks after the baseline study. And you can see TGF beta has increased at week one by 820%. VEGF has increased by 430%. Uh, Platelet-derived growth factor have, have increased by, has increased by 280%. And in three weeks, 53% uh, of the subjects had at least 50% wound area reduction. The other uh, things that happened with the wound fluid is 
Uh, IGF-1 um, uh, increased by 660%, tumor necrosis fa factor alpha increased by 450%, interleukin-6 increased by 420%, and at one week, there were significant changes in TCOM from baseline, both medially and laterally. And, and this was very exciting. And it wasn't something that the re researchers thought that they would find initially, but was discovered at week one. And so this slide I know is busy, but you can see um, to the far left uh, for uh, visit one before CDO, there are the levels of the various cytokines and growth factors. And then look at visit Two, and typically what we're seeing here are more cytokines that are growing, uh, going up, but by uh, week, our visit three, week two, now um, we are seeing more of the um, growth factors going up. And by the third week, now the wound fluid is starting to look more normal and not like a chronic wound fluid, but more looking like an acute wound with the appropriate levels of cytokines and growth factors. The other interesting research that has been done uh, recently in the US, and, and this is a pilot study, and these are interim results. And this was done by a surgical group out of Baylor College of Medicine. They were having a lot of problems with toe amputations, and they were having a lot of these amputation sites uh, dehiss and open up. Uh, and so wanted to do a study to see what the impact of, of CDO would be over a closed amputation site. And so you can see that the incidence of tissue necrosis with CDO was zero versus 43% in the control group that just got the you know, normal standard care. And the, the healing rate was significantly higher in the CDO group, 75% versus 29% in, in the control group. And as well, wound length reduction was 70% greater in the CDO arm versus the control group. Now, I'm sure you're looking at the p-values, but remember, these are interim results. And so an acceptable p-value with interim results is uh, 1, 0.1. And what the researchers reported is a noticeable trend in favor of CDO to accelerate healing in surgically closed wounds and to reduce the lice, uh, you know, to reduce the likelihood of, of, of adverse events, which no clinician and no uh, surgeon wants. Now, a similar study was done looking at anterior neck surgery and scar reduction. Uh, and so what they found was the incision uh, uh, length was. 40% uh, further reduced in the CDO arm. And if you think about these patients, these would be people that would have a very visible scar on their anterior neck. And so the cosmetic um, view is very important to most people. And so not only did we have a 40% reduction in incision length, but a greater than 10% scar reduction at, at four weeks. And so, the uh, researchers felt that using CDO may improve wound healing after anterior neck surgery and include better outcomes for scar visualization. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Rosemary Hill, who's going to be talking about another one of her cases. Thank you, Karen. Um, yeah, um, if for the sake of time, we'll move through this case uh, fairly quickly, but uh, this was my first experience with continuous diffusion of oxygen. It was a 49 year old gentleman who had type two diabetes um, and not a very good hemoglobin A1C as you can see. And uh, so uh, he presented with osteomyelitis and we had him on IV uh, piperacillin. Next slide. And um, things were looking not great. And so I included the um, orthopedic surgeon's note. It's the documentation from the chart, which said, you know, it's looking that this area is going to need to be debridement, uh, debrided. We're going to do an IND. There'll be a fifth toe amputation, but there's a fairly high possibility that he will need a baloney amputation. Obviously, we wanted to avoid that at all costs. So in the OR, I think I have some photos um, where we, um, you're going to see the actual debridement. Um, and um, this was actually the chart indicates a, a final report uh, where 
things were not good and he was a high risk patient. And so um, there's a lot of concern. And of course the patient spoke vehemently that we must not, regardless of what we found, we must not um, obviously amputate his foot. Next slide. So this is us in the OR doing the debridement and right away following debridement, we had uh, negative pressure application and we continued to uh, do that for quite a while, but they're just really, we weren't seeing much in the way of results. And when I say that we weren't seeing a lot of granulation tissue in the wound bed, and you'll see what I mean by the next slide, where the wound bed just was quite pale. And so finally we began the continuous diffusion of oxygen. So when you see the slide of December 5th, that was after two weeks of negative pressure wound therapy. So we just were, it was nothing, nothing happening, no granulation tissue. And then we began the oxygen therapy and it was slow to begin with, but we started seeing the edges begin to pink up. And so we persisted um, and uh, we did tend to change the dressing every two days because when you do use continuous diffusion of oxygen, you get more exudate. And so um, it was a relatively simple dressing change. Um, and we tended to use some hydrofer um, some methylene blue and uh, gentian violet. Next slide. Again, um, this is now only several weeks later, but you're definitely seeing the transformation to that wound bed. Um, and the next slide. And this is, uh, as Kathy mentioned earlier, that red tissue, maybe it looks on the picture as if it's hypergrant, but it's actually very sturdy, robust granulation tissue, and it is not that friable. And so we persisted, uh, and now we're just a month out and we've got this gorgeous wound bed. Um, and indeed, it's looking very optimistic at salvage. Next slide. We continued on. At some point, some might say, well, did you consider going back to negative pressure wound therapy? But we were making such progress at each change that we felt we would just continue with the continuous diffusion of oxygen. Um, and he was becoming very comfortable with the device, charging it. Um, and we, um, he was mobilizing, uh, but we made sure there was no pressure uh, to that area. And finally, uh, by March, um, we're really looking by February 18th, it's really closing up. He's now in the community. The community nurses are changing his dressings, um, generally Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then ultimately um, his wound closed, that's March 10th, and he eventually closed and he remains closed. So that case um, was now over a year plus. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited to say that here we are in uh, April 2021, and he continues to have both his feet walking around. Um, and um, so it was a very, very positive outcome, of course, for this gentleman. He, he occasionally gets little wounds on his other foot and he'll say, hey, Rosemary, do you think, do you, think you should get that oxygen machine? And, uh, but I say, no, it's not, at this point, we're not ready yet for, for that, but um, they've been more superficial. And that's the end of that case study. And I think that concludes um, our time with you today. But just in summary, let, let's just, you know, touch base on some of those summary thoughts when we think of this uh, modality. It is cost effective. It's certainly, I, um, my patients uh, with the neuropathic foot and the lady with her breast didn't have uh, considerable pain issues, but Kathy's patients did. Um, and so it's really remarkable um, about the fact that people are using less narcotics when they're reaching for the continuous diffusion of oxygen. It is naturally also antibacterial and there is um, full wound healing. Uh, you would wear it 24 seven and uh, the unit is light um, carrying case and an easily sort of a chargeable situation for it. So um, the, the second generation models 
are much, uh, much more user friendly. So at this time, we'll, we'll pause and we'll take time to um, answer any questions. We've um, attached our emails, but I really wanna thank um, all of the ENSWALKs across Canada and our WOCN colleagues in the States uh, for taking the time out in their day and listening to us uh, share our thoughts and experiences with continuous diffusion of oxygen. Thank you.